every single one of our major customers and minor customers all shut their doors overnight. You need the right people in the right place at the right time. And sometimes you have the right people in the right place, but at the wrong time. I've got to keep going forward. I've got to keep looking for revenue streams. I've got to keep looking for growth, keep looking at new ways of doing things. But, you know, what's the culture like at the business? What do what do we stand for, the values? I've got to tick that box on my personal development program for the, I don't really want to be here. Scaling up a business isn't easy. If it were, we wouldn't have less than 4% of businesses scaling beyond 10 employees or around a million pound turnover level and less than 1% beyond 50 employees. But the contribution that we make as owner managers to our economies is immense and should never be underestimated. Yet it can be a tough gig for all of us at times. And only other business owners truly understand the challenges that we face. And through Scale Up Radio, we aim to help make things a little easier. We interview guests who have been where you are now and may have faced some of the challenges that you are facing. And they offer their thoughts and advice on what has worked for them, as well as what didn't. And we've also combined many of the lessons from these interviews and also through working with hundreds of owner managers over the last 10 years or so into a practical scale up handbook that we've called the Entrepreneurial Scale Up System or ESIS. And it's for owner managers like you and me as we navigate our own scale up journey. And you can order a copy through your favorite online book retailer or by going to all the W's, esisgroup.co.uk, www esusgroup.co.uk On this week's episode of Scale Up Radio, I speak with Duncan Sutcliffe from Sutcliffe & Co. Insurance Brokers. What do they do? Well, the clue's in the name. It's a family business that started in the 1980s, and insurance has been in the family well before that. In fact, Duncan is the fourth generation of Sutcliffe's who have worked in insurance. And the company has experienced growth since Duncan took over, even managing to grow over the pandemic in terms of their turnover and their profitability. But actually, they've reduced their headcount, so they've done more business with fewer people and therefore increased their productivity, which is interesting in its own right. And as you'll hear, Duncan worked hard to build the company and the culture out of the stereotype of what insurance brokers are viewed to be while striving for excellence with their clients. And it's a wide ranging conversation with lots of value, whether what level of business owner you are, what level your business is at. And we talk about many things, including the power of becoming a virtual team member for many clients rather than just a generic supplier or service provider. The challenge of moving communication from top down within the company to multi-directional, wanting the team to have a say in the culture and the direction of the business. So moving kind of from the leader follower type model to a leader leader model. And the benefits also that as an operations director or the benefits that an operations director can bring to any business, freeing you up as the business owner to make sure that your energies are focused in the right direction and you've got the time and the headspace to be able to do that. And what's also noticeable during our conversation is that Duncan is passionate about making sure that the company gives a good personal level of service to their clients rather than just simply providing insurance. Welcome to another episode of Skelet Radio. I'm here with Duncan Sutcliffe, who's director of Sutcliffe & Co. Insurance Brokers. So, Duncan, welcome. Hello, lovely to see you. So, Sutcliffe & Co. Insurance Brokers, guess the names, the clues in the name, but what are you all about? Yeah, so it's a, it's a family firm. Um, in its current setup, uh, started by my father, um, back in the 1980s, but... Um, before him, his father had uh, J.H. Sutcliffe & Co. And his grandfather was also an insurance broker. So I'm the fourth generation of insurance, which means we're a pretty exciting bunch, as you can imagine. <laughs> You've got, got insurance running through, your, running through your veins. Yes, <laughs> brilliant. So so what, what, um, what sort of stage have you got the business to then? What's, um, what sort of size is, is Sutcliffe & Co.? Yeah, so uh, size-wise, it's a bit peculiar in that um, we are currently at 17 uh, employees, 
although pre-lockdown, we were at 22. Uh, so we have shrunk in terms of employees, but in terms of uh, turnover and premium size, uh, we have grown. Okay. So, um, yeah, we're, we're probably up about uh, 15, 20% up on where we were before lockdown. So, yeah, uh, it's, uh, yeah. when you're thinking about uh, running a business, um, it's all about cost and ex- uh, expenditure mm-hmm. uh, against income. Well, our income has gone up and our expenditure has gone down. Um, so, yes, something's gone right. And what is it that's driven that then? Is it is it the fact that you're able to do a lot more things remotely or is something else at play? Well, we had uh, um, a combination of reasons why the size has shrunk. Um, you know, some people uh, moved on. Some people, um, we were able to change the way that we worked to uh, sort, sort of uh, um, actually make things more efficient, not needing so many p- people. And some people uh, we parted company with um, who we felt that they weren't perhaps on our uh, uh, the same path as us. Um, and and some of those changes, you know, obviously staffing is a is a major cost in any business and it certainly is in ours so we've uh, we've reduced our headcount which has uh, helped save money but actually uh, we've also been able to increase our income by some of the changes we've made which has been connected to uh, some of the staffing uh, and what sort of things are those because uh, you know I'm sitting here imagining you've got five fewer people you've got more business to do how you know how are you, how are you managing to to keep the business running and, and not have everybody tearing their hairs out, hair out yeah that's uh, some some days you think gosh I could do with another five or ten people um, yep. to help fight the fire um, but uh, yeah, actually a lot of it came down to um, some of the th- th- things that that you uh, that you coach people on uh, you know about the sort of the the ethos and behaviors within a business so we 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 put a lot of work in uh, before lockdown uh, of, of what sort of culture we wanted our business to be okay. and uh, that culture has come through and we are now you know, very much more focused on providing uh, excellence in customer service, but also excellence in service to each other. Um, and so yeah, I think a lot of that has has made us far more, not just productive, but also a far better place to work. Um, you know, it's people, uh, I was talking to one of my colleagues the other day and she was actually saying that sort of Sunday nights, she has a sort of tingle of excitement that she's got to go to work the next day, which, which for many people is alien. Um, well, there's, there's not for, for, yeah, there's probably not many people listening that, that, uh, yeah, that, that would say, yeah, all of my team are, are like that. Um, and equally, it's not the first thought you'd have about working for an insurance company, is it? Well, no, no, absolutely. Um, but uh, yeah, we've, yeah, we, as a, as a team, we had many uh, sort of discussions and uh, workshops about. Our, our culture, where we wanted to be, what we wanted to be, um, what good looked like, what bad looked like, yeah. and more importantly, what excellent looked like. Um, and we didn't want to be good. We wanted to be excellent. Yeah. And um, you know, w- what an excellent insurance broker is to its clients, uh, to its insurance companies, and to its colleagues. Uh, and, um, and as a result, I think we've... Uh, yeah, productivity has definitely um, increased as a result of just being a happier place to work. Um, yeah, efficiencies have, have come out of it um, uh, and all sorts. Very good. No, that, that's, yeah, sounds, sounds superb to have managed to, managed to achieve that um, over what's been a really, really trying period for, for all of us. So, yeah. Really, really good. And I mean, you mentioned a couple of things there, but what would you say then separates Sutcliffe and Co from your competitors from the average insurance broker? That's a real difficult one um, because yeah, if any person works for any company, you know, they, 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 you know, they'll move from company A to company B and their sales pattern or their introduction is likely to be the same. You know, we provide a personal service or we try and save you money or blah, blah, blah. Um, I think what 
perhaps sets us apart is we actually care. We give a damn. Um, okay. We really, really want to help people. Um, and yeah, insurance isn't um, rock and roll, um, but uh, but it is important, especially when things go wrong. Um, and we really want to help our, our clients. Um, and so I think it's just that sort of real attitude of caring um, for our clients and caring for each other within the business. Um, I think that's one of the things that separates us. You know, we're not, um, in other ways, we're not a call center. Uh, we're not a tick box organization. We're not sort of screen or computer driven. We are still very much old fashioned in the, in the way that we look after each person as an individual or each client or business as an individual. Um, so, so that is good. Um, uh, um, yeah, it has its disadvantages for us. You know, we, we talked about being um, efficient earlier. Now, if we, if we only dealt with one or two insurance companies and only sold one or two products, we could be very efficient. Um, but we don't. We deal with over 100 insurance companies, and each one of them will have numerous products. Um, so, yeah, that, that um, it removes an efficiency, but it but it adds to the level of service, uh, professionalism, and advice that we can give. Yeah, and it, it keeps things very interesting for us, and uh, gives us a certain sense of pride in that you know we're able to help people solve their problems, look after them to the best of our ability, not mm -hmm. simply, yeah, you know, robotically providing insurance because yeah. it fits our box. Yeah. Okay. Are you able to give one or two tangible examples of, of how that's that's played out, perhaps? Gosh, yeah. Um, we we um, yes. Sometimes we'll yeah we'll we'll. We'll see clients who are perhaps with uh, insurers that are more sort of call center or target driven, and you know, we're actually you know, giving them the time and explaining what the insurances are, what they need, what they don't need, um, mm. and they they value the fact that we are working with them, almost as if they they have an in-house insurance person. Yeah, you know, we're we're part of their team, yeah, you know, to the degree that we are, we we become personal friends with many of them, um, and they will phone us up for all sorts of advice that might not be insurance related, but mm -hmm. yeah, you know, they want you know, to to share their um, their concerns or questions or or the, the, their joys with us um, mm -hmm. because we've become their trusted advisor. Um, and I think another testament would be um, some of the guys that come to work for us who've worked for other companies. Um, yeah, they, they see sort of breath of fresh air. Um, and we've got uh, one of our colleagues, she, um, she left us uh, at the start of lockdown. She was offered um, a great career progression in a large international company and she left us and uh, she's now back with us. And she, yeah, she says she regrets the day she left mm -hmm. um, because um, she's given yeah, far much more opportunity to, to be herself and to look after her clients and give them proper professional advice. Yeah. Fantastic. And she's, she's extremely happy being back with us. Yeah, no, very good. And what sort of things do you love about the insurance industry? Oh, oh, well, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, it's a strange one. I mean, growing up as a child in a, in a family of insurance brokers, <laughs> I had no interest in insurance whatsoever. Um, I had no really understanding of it. It sounded really dull, uh, and it probably sounds dull to you and, uh, and the listeners to this, but... Um, I was looking for a career move and uh, my dad said, well, why don't you look at the family business? Oh, crikey. Um, well, I know nothing about it um, was my sort of get out thing. He said, well, mm -hmm. let me send you some reading <laughs> um, and some exams. So, so he signed me up for, a, for a, a, an exam course in insurance and I did the reading that was required. And I thought, gosh, this is actually quite fascinating. And I did the exam and uh, whistled through it. And it, I just found it really interesting that the, the depth and breadth of insurance, the ways that people can be helped and, ins and insured, 
whether it's insuring physical things like buildings against fire or theft or flood, or it's uh, liabilities, slips, trips, um, industrial illness, or it could be the liabilities associated with professional advice and design. Um, and then there's all sorts of weird and wonderful things. And we've insured some really weird things. And mm. uh, it's quite fascinating. And, uh, but, but I also I love the, 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 the personal contact that we have with our clients. We're, we're primarily uh, brokers for businesses, and that's businesses of all shapes and sizes. And getting to talk to business owners about their business and learning about what they do and getting sort of very embedded within their business is just fascinating. You know, one minute I could be talking to a you know, professional services firm. The next minute I could be talking to a construction or agriculture, manufacturing, um, all different, all interesting. Um, mm. So, yes, it's um, it's not sex, drugs and rock and roll, but I find it extremely interesting and extremely satisfying to be able to solve people's problems, Yeah, especially when those claims come through and we're able to, yeah, very yeah, good. Really help people. So you've opened the door, and I'm dying to ask you, you what, what are some of the bizarre things that you've insured then? Oh, gosh. Um, really weird things. Um, we, um, we, we've insured you know, castles in Scotland, um, people taking um, bird-watching tours to the Arctic, um, all sorts of strange things. Yeah. But... Uh, we do have a, a separate brand name called Man Broadbent, which does a lot of sport and leisure insurance, and they do see some weird things. Yeah, we've had um, mass pillow fights, <laughs> um, world record um, breaking uh, cycle around the world. Um, some of the running races are that we insure are ridiculous. Um, there's one running race called the Piece of String, and you say, okay. well, how, how long is it? Yes. Well, how long is a piece of string? <laughs> yeah, the runners turn up at the start and they don't know how long the race is. It's, Seriously? <laughs> yeah, it's just um, so, so some real w weird and wonderful things. Um, uh, one of the ones we struggled to place was, uh, was horseback archery. Um, insurers don't like horses and they don't like archery. So combining the two was interesting. <laughs> I can um, imagine. But, but we get a lot of, you know, axe throwing is very popular at the moment. We, we do insure a lot of axe throwing uh, businesses. Uh, so, uh, yeah, weird Love and wonderful. It. Great stuff. And and you probably guessed I would go here, but if, if those are some of the things you love about the insurance world, what sort of things frustrate you the most? Oh, yeah. Um, we, we are a regulated industry, uh, and I think the regulation is good because you know, standards need to be high. Um and every time a new regulation comes out, it's inevitably, it's, oh, blimey, yeah, more regulation. But nine times out of 10, you look at it, you think, oh, actually, yeah, uh, that is a good thing. The, the trouble is, as many of us uh, experience, regulations are rarely um, uh, sort of communicated in a user-friendly way. So, you know, we will get presented with a, a mountain of paperwork and try to try and sift our way through converting that into the real world. So um, regulation I like, but it's it's never done in a user-friendly way. Right. So that is a frustration. So, yeah, th that can be frustrating. Um, but, uh, but on the whole, yeah, 99% of my business I, I enjoy. And any frustrations I get are the frustrations that, that, that any business owner gets. You know, that's that um, mm. occasional thing that comes across your desk that you think, oh, for goodness sake. But they're rare, thankfully. Yeah. All right. Great. So you've built a business um, to have, you know, a really good, really good number of people um, I'm, I'm, and, and, a, and a pretty good, pretty good order book by the, by the sounds of it. So let's go back to... To the beginning, maybe. I mean, it sounds like so. You said your father set it up in 1984. When when did you when did you join the business? Um, oh gosh, it would have been about 2002. So um, so went to school in Worcester, 
Uh, same school as my father and grandfather. You're, you're getting a, a gist yeah. of here that we're, we're, we're a fairly <laughs> insular bunch. Um, uh, then I went off to university uh, and then I went off to the army. And being in the army was what I okay. always wanted to do. Yep. And I did six years in the army and got to the point where I was going to have to be fighting a desk rather than right. running around in the fields. And yep. I thought, well, no, I'll look for a change. And then I, uh, so I, I left the army, um, got a, a job down in Surrey, didn't particularly enjoy that. And I was considering going back into the army, at which point that's when my dad said, try insurance. Uh, and, and I did. And I came in and started at the very bottom um, with my responsibilities involved, you know, making everyone a cup of tea, right. doing the filing at the end of the day, sending faxes, yeah, uh, Frank in the post, that kind of thing. Um, mm. And gradually work my way through um so what yeah. was what, what was that like initially coming in to work to work for your father in a in, in a in a company and to start as you said at the at the bottom essentially it was strange um yeah there was there was people who were working at the firm who i had known since i was at primary school um who would who'd work with my dad back then so it was strange coming in as um yeah the boss's son mm. uh to work with people who had 20 or 30 years experience. Um, and I'm thinking, what are you thinking? Um, yep. uh, am I just the boss's son that, that sort of brat turned up to, uh, you know, uh, become the boss, um, with no experience or uh, ability. Um, but, um, yeah, I think, uh, because I was, was starting at the bottom, I was able to, um, yeah, gradually prove that I wasn't just the boss's son, that I, I did know uh, bits and bobs and I, I learned and I worked with my colleagues and uh, built up mutual trust. But yes, um, it was certainly in my, in my mind a lot for the first few years that you know, these, these people know a hell of a lot more than me. Um, but the great thing is, you know, I've got colleagues here now who um um who've been working for the firm for over 40 years mm. um and yeah they've they've seen me from short trousers to where i am now <laughs> excellent so what i mean how yeah i imagine you're a very different person from then um but also the company's probably very different from when you joined in 2002 so what what sort of ways is the is, is the business different yeah, gosh, it's, it's changed a lot. When I first arrived, regulation was only just coming in. Um, and we've had a huge number of regulatory changes since then. So um, the way we've done things, you know, we, I think as a business, we've always been professional and customer focused. But I think this has focused us more um, which, which has been good. So that has been a major change. It does create a huge administrative burden. Um, you know, we have um, people who are employed purely doing regulatory uh, assistance for us. So uh, uh, rather than actually uh, earning money. Um, so that is a change. Um, but yeah, we, we have progressed a lot, you know, um, as many offices will have done, you know, so we're not using carbon paper and fax machines anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Some of my younger colleagues, you know, you show them what, a thing of liquid paper and yeah. they don't know what on earth that's for. Um, <laughs> Good old, you know, old tip -X. Yeah, but yeah, we, we have gone paperless now. Um, so we, uh, we got rid of um, 45 filing cabinets during lockdown because lockdown wow. was a good opportunity to get rid of them. Um, we still have a few, um, yeah. but um, yeah, I can't remember the last time I actually had to pick up a paper file. So that's great. Um, we've, we've also moved with the times in terms of the types of insurance. So we do a hell of a lot, hell of, a lot of what's called cyber insurance. So that's insuring people against the, mm -hmm. the risks associated with deliberate or accidental data breaches um, mm. or you know, things like viruses, hacks, ransoms, and so forth. And so we've been, we've been quite uh, ahead of the game in that um, compared to some of our uh, competitors. We, you know, we, we ensure a lot of people across the country for that because you know, we could see that that was coming. Um, 
And so, yeah, and there have been other trends and changes uh, and we try and keep up to date with what's new. I mean, this morning we were looking at, um, we're doing some training on a relatively new kind of flood insurance where you have a sensor on the side of your building and when the sensor get wet, you get sent money. It's as simple as that. So it's, it's oh. not old fashioned insurance where, you know, you have to have a flood and prove how much damage has happened. And some months later, you'll get some money. Mm. This is a simple sense on the building. The sensor gets wet. You get sent your money. Um, wow. And so, so we, we try and keep up to date with, with changes in insurance, but also changes in society. And so that we can ensure the changes in society. So, you think about cars now, yeah, electric cars is something different. A lot of them have black boxes. Um, mm. uh, they, they might have uh, cameras fitted. Um, so th- there's lots of changes there. Um, and mm. uh, and so, so, so that's one of the things. Um, I think we're also far more, uh, as an office, um, a lot more independence of thought um uh, people are given a lot more responsibility within the office okay um w- which is great to see um we don't have sort of hierarchies and uh, what used to be referred to as the girls in the typing pool um <laughs> that is long gone yeah um so uh, yeah yeah C- culturally some some huge changes okay and what about in terms of the number of people within the within the business i mean you're you obviously we're up at 22 you're at 17 now what what sort of numbers were in the business when you when you started oh yeah so it's a lot smaller i suppose it was about 12 when i started yeah. um and and that has changed uh in in yeah the, the, there were some very much typist roles then mm-hmm. um now uh, yeah everyone there's no, there's no sort of roles for simply processing it's everyone is a is a broker um everyone has to uh, actively sort of participate and think um it's um and it's great because we've got some of some of my colleagues who were um initially been in a very sort of administrative processing role and now uh gained in confidence and developed and it's great to see them blossom um uh, being able to speak to people on the phone, give advice, share their knowledge and uh, sort of, you know, be brokers rather than processors. Yeah. So how, how have you managed that transition then in, in, in people? So you've, you've, you've gone, does sound like then you've gone from a business where it was fairly, the communication and the flow was pretty much one way top to, top to bottom by the by the sounds of it to one which is much more much more cohesive working working together um along that so how have you how have you managed that transition alongside the fact that you've now got increasing complexities with the communication pathways in, in that you've got more people to to actually manage and look after yeah um it's it's been a slow process um i mean change uh, generally is and, and, and quick change can often be disastrous but um the uh we, we certainly try to be more inclusive so um yeah we will have um regular team meetings um at different levels and we'll also have meetings across the whole business um where people are encouraged to interact so it's not just me sitting down telling people what i want them to do it's mm-hmm. very much collaborative um because yeah everyone in the office sees things from a different perspective and they're all small wheels in a big machine and they might experience or or see something that the rest of us can't so everyone's input is is extremely important um and and it's the cultural discussions that we've had which i think have been have been great you know talking about you know what we expect from each other Mm-hmm. Um, what we expect a, an excellent broker to do um, has been uh, has been transformative, um, and there's a lot of honesty and openness and trust uh, within the business now, which 
which is really conducive to uh, to sort of effective working as a team and providing a an excellent service. So so that is good. Um, communication, um, I think, has has come on leaps and bounds. We also have uh, a weekly office surgery, which is where okay. I put aside an hour every week where anyone can come and see me on any matter. Yeah. Um, now, it very rarely gets used because if someone wants to come and see me, they just come and see me. But by having that office surgery enables, you know, that they know that not only is that expression of the doors always open, but you know, there is a time put aside so they can come and talk to me about a work issue, a personal issue, uh, whatever. Um, and, uh, and, and that's great. But also, yeah, I've got a, some of the guys who are in sort of leadership roles are absolutely excellent. Um, and they keep a regular communication going with their colleagues, um, either in teams or as one-to-ones. And during lockdown, that was fabulous because um, when we weren't all under the same roof, um, and we work in an open plan office now, we have we have no the only private offices we have are for meetings or okay. things like. I, I sit in the office with everyone, um, uh, so. So when people were working at home, um, one of my colleagues, um, she would phone up everyone every week for a how's it going kind of chat. Mm. And it was a you know, genuinely cared. Yeah. And I think I've said that before. We care and we care about our colleagues. So, and that was great because I don't know about your experience of lockdown, but there was parts of lockdown that I absolutely loved. But there are also parts of lockdown which I didn't love. Yeah. Um, and the, some of my colleagues were the same, and some of them found some really tough days. And having that support was was fantastic. Um, and so I think people knowing that they've got um, uh, uh, an ear to to talk to or a or a shoulder to cry on um, has been has been fantastic. And we're we're a real tight bunch now and i think yeah i know that if something awful happened that i would i would have the support of my colleagues and they, and they would say the same i'm sure great so how have you how have you structured the the, the teams or how this, the business with seven, 17 people what sort of you said it's a bit bit flatter than it used to be but what what yeah. is the what is the rough structure well we it's uh, as insurance brokerages tend to have what we call uh, account executives who would be the the sort of uh, customer facing staff, and then they have account handlers who provide the administrative support behind the execs, and so we tend to pair uh, an executive up with a handler, so they have their own team of two. Okay. Um, but uh, we also have the handlers in a team of their own, um, and the executives in a team of their own. So. Okay. Uh, the executives will have team meetings, the handlers will have team meetings, and then the, each executive will have a meeting with their own handler. Yeah. Um, and then we have management meetings. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's lots of collaboration and communication. Um, and I think one of my boring favourite expressions is, yeah, whatever you're doing, remember what happens if you're hit by a bus. Yeah. Can, yeah, can your colleagues pick up your client and, and and carry on working so communication is essential in, as part of a customer service thing mm. um yeah, yeah it's no good me having lots of knowledge about a client or a case in my head if i'm hit by a bus yeah here we go insurance is always thinking of the worst it's uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah but uh, absolutely and i and i'm imagine with it being such a regulated environment that's um, you've you've got there's a CRM presumably that that you that you have that where everybody is keeping all their client contact details up to date and um, any of the contacts that they've had presumably. Yes, and I think that's one of the big changes um, uh, over the years in that um, ourselves and insurance industry in general is far better at record keeping. Um, yeah. Yeah. So you so you showed so you mentioned the, the the management side of things. So have you you have you got yourself a management team essentially as well now? Yes, yeah. So that uh, our, uh, we went on um, uh, a, a sort of one day course 
um, my father and I a few years ago, which was run by um, the insurance industry. And they, they called it the insurance dragon's den. And the idea was you would, oh. you would uh, provide some facts and figures about the business, a few of your strengths and weaknesses and concerns. And you'd go and you'd spend a day with three of the top people in insurance. And they basically rip you to shreds and then build you back together again yep. um, with some top tips of where to go forwards. And the top tip that they gave us was that um, uh, I was trying to run the business um, and look after clients and do, do too much really. Mm. And they said, well, what I needed if I'm going to run a better business is I either need to, focus on my clients or focus on um, the operational side of things. Um, yeah. But I can't do it all yeah. um, and manage the business. Um, so uh, I took on an operations manager and that would be a huge recommendation I would make for yeah. many business owners of businesses um, who are reaching a size where the business owner can't do it all. You know, if you're running a small business, you're, your head of IT, HR, um, accounts, you name it, you're in charge of it all. You can't do it all. So this operations manager has been a godsend um, and has allowed me to um, share the workload. And we've become a really close partnership. Um, certainly since my father died four years ago, um, oh, she's yeah. been... Um, yeah, she's been my absolute right hand and uh, we work very well together. We are very complementary in our skills and outlooks um, and uh, running a business on your own, as many business owners would appreciate, can be lonely at times. So being able to throw ideas off someone, um, uh, take advice and counsel from someone is great. Mm -hmm. And of course, offload and delegate, which is which is a skill in itself, has been great. Um, and um, yeah, so that has been uh, has been invaluable having a, a, a skillful and trusted operations manager. Yeah, and at what um, what sort of stage were you at then when you and your father went on that that course and and were advised to do that? Well, I suppose we were we were starting to grow. We had ambitions to be better. Mm -hmm. um, um, but, um, you know, wanting to be better is easier said than done. Yeah. And we were, we, we, we were yeah, sort of constantly coming up with, uh, you know, new things would get in the way. You know, again, as business owners, you, you probably appreciate that, you know, you, you have a plan for that day, you turn up for work and there's an email <laughs> and that day doesn't go to plan. Yeah. Um, so um, we were at, at the stage where we had had intentions, but we weren't moving very well um, by bringing in the operations manager freed up a lot of t time. So uh, we weren't being reactive every day. We were able to be proactive. Um, we were able to plan, um, step back and, yeah, look at the business yeah um yeah so we we were able to steer the ship as well as shoveling the coal and cleaning the decks um because we were sharing that workload um and and that yeah in time enabled us to uh, to make some of the improvements and changes that that we thought would make us a a great business rather than yeah. a good business Great. So you've been able to essentially delegate some of the more the, obviously the operational side of things to somebody else. They look after that. So how how do you keep yourself um, comfortable that the right things are being done? What sort of what sort of metrics do you? you know, what are the key key things you like to see so that you know that things are under control? Yeah, um, it's. Management information is, is is fantastic and essential, but it's difficult because the more management information hmm. one compiles, the the, the 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 more complex and confusing it yes. gets. You can get swamped in numbers, and yeah. and knowing the relevance of the numbers um, it can be difficult. And and I get quite fascinated by stats 
and I could just sit all day and look at them. Um, but you, you, you can't do that. So it's um, it's picking out a few key ones. I think uh, one of the early things we talked about was the, the simple income versus expenditure. Um, just, yeah, yeah, keeping an eye on what our income is and what our expenditure is. Um, keeping an eye on where income is compared to this time last year. Okay. Um, uh, and expenditure compared to this time last year. Um, and looking for any sort of trends in, um, you know, if, if, if a client uh, leaves us, you know, why have they left us? You know, most cases it's because you know, they've, they've reached retirement age and, and they're closing the business or they've sold the business up. Um, but sometimes you know, it might be, oh, gosh, I wasn't expecting that. Yeah. Um, but also looking at where new business has come from. Oh, creating a trend there. Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, another one's come through that route. Oh, great. And so it's putting effort into where success is and putting effort into stop where failures are. Mm. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah. Okay. But, yeah, there's, there's a plenty of stats. To yeah. Look at. And do you have any... Do you have any measures for productivity? Because obviously that's on a, on a very simple level, that's clearly improved quite a lot since um, over lockdown, given that you've increased your turnover and reduced yeah. the headcount. It's, it's, it's a difficult one. Um, yeah, on, on a large scale, you can sort of see income and expenditure and, and see where, where the gap is, hopefully a, a positive gap. But when looking at individuals, um, it can be tricky. You think, well, we we can see how many phone calls people make, how many emails they send, how many emails they receive, how much income that person um, is transacting in, in a month. Um, but because what we do is so so varied, it's, it can be complicated. You know, mm. there can you can think, oh gosh, yeah, so and so they're they're not doing anything. They've only sent out a couple of letters. Yeah. But then you look again at a different set of metrics and you think, crikey, they're really doing well. Yeah. It's a tough one. Um, it, it really is tough. Um, so, yeah, it, so we, we do look at people's individual as, as individuals. And uh, we see, certainly with the account execs who are more customer facing, we look at oh, yeah, how many policies they deal with what their income is, what their income per policy is, yeah. and and how that works across the board uh, uh, as a contribution to the business. Um, so we can see that some are um, more more affected than others, but um, but we are all wheels in the machine, mm. um, and yeah, th- th- yeah. There's some wheels that are not making any money, but if they weren't here, the machine wouldn't work. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, good. And um, one of the questions I'd like to ask everyone um, is, is, is around what have you found to be the most successful way of finding new customers, new clients? What's, what works, what sort of things work for you? Doing a bloody good job, I think is, yeah, uh, okay. uh, is, is because it's referrals and recommendations. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, we we're getting a, an increasing number of inquiries via the website uh, and via social media. Okay, but they're coming to us um, because they've seen our name and uh, they, they they want insurance. But it's not much warmer than using the old phone book or yellow pages. If you're mm. old enough to remember that, um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, whereas a referral or recommendation they've come to you because they want to buy insurance from you. Yes. They haven't come to you because they want insurance. They've come to us because they want insurance from us. And it, I think it would be the same, whatever industry yeah. you're in. Yeah. So again, if you, if your toilet's playing up, yeah, you could go to the yellow pages and get a plumber, but you, mm. you one would yeah. generally say to a friend, Oh, do you know a good plumber? And they oh yeah, use Fred. Well, you phone Fred up. And you don't ask what he's got to cost. You just get him around because your friend has recommended him. So referrals and recommendations, I think, works fabulously for us. And I think it would work for, yeah. for most businesses. Um, so yeah. Okay. Uh, that's, yeah, in terms of conversion rate from converting an inquiry to an insurance policy, yeah, 
a huge success rate there. Uh, if they were coming to us just through the internet, we have a good success rate, but it's it's, it's not not as good as a referral. Mm. Yeah, very good. I think that's that's an interesting way of looking at it as well, because we all, you know, some of us are guilty of saying, well, you know, how many new leads have we generated as a, as, a, as the measure? Whereas actually we need to be much more clever than that because one referral lead could be worth 10 leads from the internet, for example, just in terms of the conversion rate that you're likely to get. Oh, absolutely. So, yeah. so do you have any ways of actively encouraging referrals or does it just happen naturally? You leave it to happen naturally. Fortunately, it happens naturally, but we do, we do try and encourage as well. You know, um, yeah, we, we've got good relationships with with businesses that would naturally cross paths with people and discuss their insurance. You know, it might be okay. accountants, solicitors, and so forth. And yeah. you know, if we've got good relationships with them and we've helped other clients of theirs, yeah, you know, that 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 uh, good reputation uh, will will stick. Um, so, so, so that naturally works well. Um, we don't really have any incentive um, uh, schemes or anything like that to uh, bribe referrals yeah. or recommendations. But uh, yeah, we try and use uh, our reputation as good people. Um, also aware that um, yeah, good news spreads fast, but bad news spreads far faster and far further. So. Yeah. Yeah, we are, we are we're very conscious that yeah, yeah, everything has to be done excellently. Okay, good. Another another question I like to ask everybody is if 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 you and I were having this conversation in five years' time, Duncan, what what has to have happened for you to consider those five years a, a success? Certainly professionally, but maybe also personally. Gosh, yeah. Well. Um, Still here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'd like to think we'd be doing exactly the same, but bigger and better. Okay. Um, and I'm not talking about taking over the world. Um, I think what we do is uh, we do a very good job and we provide a very good service. We've got lots of very good customers. Um, uh, yeah, as I said earlier on, yeah, good is not good enough. Excellent is what I want to be, and I want all my colleagues to be excellent, and I want our um, I want to be the broker of choice. So I want um, insurance companies would want to work with us. I want other brokers wish they worked for us, right? And I want everyone that's got a business or anything that needs insuring to think, oh, I wish we were insured by Sutcliffe and Co. Brilliant. That's what I want. Um, uh, but yeah, I'm not taking over the world, but certainly regionally, um, that's that's what I would like. Um, right. Yeah, and and I mean, clearly, insurance has been in the been in the family, as it were, for quite some time. What's what do you hope happens when when you decide you not don't want to be running Sutcliffe anymore? Well, um, good question. I. Uh, I feel old enough to retire, but <laughs> circumstances <Me too. laughs> circumstances mean I can't. Um, I'm still I'm still quite young. Uh, uh, when well, uh, as a business owner, um, so uh, my children are still at school. So, yeah, thinking about hanging up my briefcase is a is a long way off. Yeah, um, my children quite sensibly are showing no interest in insurance, but then my children are only interested in you know, sleeping uh, uh, playing on TikTok or whatever kids do these days. So um, no idea. Um, Fair enough. The, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a long way off and I'm still really enjoying it. Um, I'm enjoying the job. I'm enjoying working with my colleagues. I'm enjoying communicating with my clients. Um, I'm very conscious that yeah, if someone were to turn up with a big wedge of cash that was uh, very tempting, I'd also very conscious that, well, I don't want to hand over my colleagues and my clients yeah. Yeah. to uh, some new owner that is not going to treat them with the care yes. and love that, that, that I have. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, very good. And, um, Another question that, that, that I like to ask everyone, is there, are there any bits of technology, whether it be apps or software that you've found to be really useful 
within the within the business? Um, we're still very much sort of office and desk based, so uh, most of our client conversations are face to face or on the telephone, okay, or you know with a bit of email in between. Although you know we've started selling travel insurance this year. Uh, quote and buy on the website we're looking at adding cycle insurance on this week okay um although that's in the hands of the it people so it could be any time between now and doomsday um <laughs> so um and we we've got uh I mentioned we do a lot of sport and leisure insurance we're looking at adding our some of our sport and leisure products on there so like things like if you're a, a football coach or um or, or something like that you, you you could purchase that online so we're looking at uh we're we're talking with a software developer about that at the moment. Um, I think I suppose the biggest transformation is being able to work mobilely. Um, mm-hmm. So um, is being able to see your emails 24 hours a day a good thing or a bad thing? It, it, it's both, I think. Um, when I first started in the business, the postman would, would turn up with a sore back carrying sacks of post. Now we probably get three or four letters a day but we get yeah, emails yeah. making the phone lines hot. Um, and yeah, when the post used to come in, yeah, you'd, you'd put it into a pile and you'd go through it in priority and you'd answer it in sensible time. Now emails come in, yeah, you're halfway through one email, another email comes in and yeah, there's an expectation to jump onto that before you finish the first one. So, um, but also, yeah, if an email comes in at night or the weekend or while I'm on holiday, that's urgent. Um, I can look after it and help my client. Um, mm. um, or I can certainly, if I'm, uh, if I'm away for a few days, I can go through it and, yeah, you know, and deal with things. So I'm not coming back into a pile of post, but um, mm. so I think that's, that's good. And one of our colleagues during lockdown relocated, she, she moved house to South Wales and, um, four or five years ago, that would have probably been the end of her career with us. Whereas mm. now you wouldn't know. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, everyone else came back to work in the office. Uh, and she said to her colleagues, by the way, I've moved to Wales. <laughs> I won't be coming back. And she carries on as, and it, and it hasn't made a, a jot of negative difference. Um, and it, it's helped her family life no end. So that's great. Good. Excellent. And um, are there any, what you know? What books or podcasts, anything like that, that you'd that have made a difference to you that you'd recommend to others? Yeah, um, obviously everything that you do, Kevin, um, yeah. is is phenomenal. But um, um, there's a very old book, um, and I'm trying to remember what it's called. Is it "Who Moved My Cheese"? Ah, who ate my cheese? Who who, who ate my cheese? Think. Yeah, something like that. Or who moved the cheese? Who ate the cheese? Very old book. Um, very small book. You know, it's it's only I don't know about 45, 40 or fifty pages long. Yes. Um, and that's just about uh, change in business. It's very. It's it reads like a children's story, yeah. but it's clearly aimed at adults. And I thought I thought that was fantastic. Yeah. No, you're right. It's who moved who moved my cheese. Who moved my cheese? Yeah. yeah. By Spencer um, Johnson, yeah, very good. And I, I've read a very good book on presenting um, and communicating by a chap called Simon Lancaster. And I can't remember what the book was called, but I've just bought his latest book, which came out this week, called Connect. Okay. Um, and he used to be a political speech writer, and it's all about you know, communicating well. Um but um, I think there's uh, and there's there's a few others as well, but I can't remember no, what they are. But... That's great. So no, yeah, Simon Simon Lancaster um, Connect is his latest one, as you as you say. Was it? Would it? He's he's done a couple by the looks of it. You are not human. I think was 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 one. Uh, Follow the leader, winning minds. I think they're winning minds. Yeah, is that the one. Yeah, yeah. brilliant. So, um, but but I think. Yeah, there there are a lot of um, leadership courses and training courses and management courses and business development courses out there and presenters and speakers. Um, yeah, 
and uh, you go on some of these courses and it, it can be tempting to say, well, yeah, that's obvious. Well, that's common sense. So I knew that already, but my word, yeah, be, the, the, being reminded of these things that are common sense and obvious mm. is worth its weight in gold because, yeah, I know I've been on these courses talk, oh, that's obvious, but I'm not doing it or yeah. I'm not doing it enough or well enough. Yeah. So uh, um, I have been on lots of uh, various courses, either industry specific or, or general, and I continue to go on them mm. because um, uh, every day is a school day. And, um, and it certainly helped our business improve it's learned. I've learned about myself. I've learned about my colleagues. I've learned about clients, um, how to communicate, to lead. Um, there's so many th- things to learn, and just a yeah, a little snippet or incremental change um, all adds up. Um, yeah. yeah. So really yeah. Good. And if you were if you were to go back to your younger self, maybe when you maybe when you f- first came into uh, in, into the business, what either what advice would you give your younger self, or or maybe what would you have done differently? Put another way, um, yeah, good one. Hmm. Um, I think there's there's a lot of things that um, yeah are put off. Um, so, so, Having an operations manager now has given me more time to do a lot of these things, and I do them. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of things, um, certainly from a, from an HR side of things, that um, that are just put off. So yeah, having more communication with colleagues is something that I still don't do enough of, and we certainly didn't used to do. So I think I'd like to have done that more. Yeah. Also, we've uh, we've got a great team now, but uh, culturally we had a few bad apples um, some years ago, um, and it's amazing the the difference to uh, the office right. and the service by removing a couple of bad apples. And it can be easy to give someone a second chance or to overlook failings. Um, but I think if someone is just is coming along for the ride or um, has a different uh, culture or goal, yeah. then, yeah, uh, something needs to be done. Um, they've either, you've either got to get them on board to come with you or they've got to, yeah, take their own ship somewhere else. Yeah, very good. And now that you've really spent time defining that with the team, you can be really clear about that. And uh, yeah, I'll identify earlier, no doubt. Yeah. Great. Now, that's been really interesting talking with you, Duncan. Thank you very much for your time today and for uh, being a guest on Scale Up Radio. If people would like to get hold of you or uh, Sutcliffe & Co., what's the best way for them to do that, Duncan? Well, now we don't really have phone books or yellow pages. It would yes. be probably through the website, uh, uh, www.sutcliffeinsurance.co.uk or they can come direct to me at duncan at sutcliffeinsurance.co.uk. Brilliant. Duncan, thank you very much indeed for being my guest. Thank you, Kevin. Don't forget to take a look at www.bizsmarts.co.uk to access a great range of resources to help you in your scale-up journey. So that's bizsmarts.co.uk, which is B-I-Z-S-M-A-R-T-S.co.uk. This has been a Monkey Pants Productions podcast.